Hello everyone and welcome to Life and Sport Season 2. I'm Ivani Quillen and uh, during Series 1 I spoke to 13 sports industry professionals about their careers, their ambitions and their lives in sport. Those episodes have recently been made available on Spotify so feel free to look back on our catalogue of discussions which range from careers in sports marketing, photography, physio, law, PR, journalism and a whole lot more. Now I'm delighted to say that we're kicking off Series 2 and I'm joined by guidance counsellor and career coach Neve Dwyer, who is going to uh, turn the tables on me and uh, talk to me about my career in sports broadcasting. So it's my turn to be nervous and it's my turn to be peppered with questions. <laughs> um, Neve, uh, mycareerplan.ie, I think is your website. You're very welcome right. to Life in Sport. I couldn't have asked for a better person to... <laughs> To ask me questions because it is all about just trying to find uh, various uh, careers in sports. So um, yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself, for, first of all, and your website. Yeah, so I'm a guidance counsellor and uh, I've recently set up my career plan. So I'm on social media and I have my own website. So I work with students, still with the teenagers, which I love. But it's also given me a chance to work with adults, which is fabulous and work with, you know, a slightly I suppose wider range of people so I'm getting to meet lots of new people and work with them in different contexts and at very different stages in their careers event which is lovely I'm used to dealing with students making choices as they leave us in secondary school you know and head off in whatever direction they're going so it's really nice now to be connected with people at very different stages in their careers so absolutely loving the variety and um, it's just opened up lots of doors gotten to meet lots of new people connect with people like yourself and all that so it's it's fabulous so I'm really really enjoying it and I suppose it's nice myself to do something in the middle of my career that's a little bit different. Absolutely. I, I, it's all, I'm all about that. Um, and that's why I kicked off this podcast as well, because like that now, there are a lot of people who are kind of maybe thinking about moving into something else or maybe have an interest in sport and some qualifications and just want to try and make a career out of it. So um, that's what this is all about. So you're a perfect person to talk to me about my career. So um, yeah, I'll hand over the mic to you. Off brilliant, you brilliant. Well, I hope you're not too nervous now, Yvan, you know, that you're, <laughs> you're in the hot seat for once. So I suppose I'd love to start, Yvan, we see a lot of what you're doing on the media, obviously, which is the public, Yvan, and that. But I'd love to take you back to when you were in school and just tell us a little bit about, you know, what you were like as a student. I know you were sports sports mad and I suppose what I'm interested in was it always the plan to work in sports or uh, was that something that evolved? No it absolutely was not a plan to work in sport. I didn't really think about a career. I don't think anyone really does when they're 12 or 15 or 17 and if they do they're exceptionally organized and <laughs> I wouldn't be putting you know that thought into any teenager's head because I think I really enjoyed school actually um, and I threw myself into it and everything outside of the classroom as well so I was basically I filled every hour of every day so I, obviously I was in school but I loved as you said I loved sports so I played a lot of sports I played basketball or camogie after school I did modern dance at least twice a week as well I played the clarinet um so I would have been at lessons for clarinet but I was also in an orchestra I was in a couple of choirs um and that was kind of my teenage years going back to younger than that I did everything from swimming tennis athletics you know add in all of the other things that I tried but as a teenager, yeah, I was just so into everything. And I did a lot of debating as well, actually. I was okay. um, I was in an English school, um, the presentation in Kilkenny, but I had a really good Irish teacher, Michal O'Keeve, and he um, nurtured my love of the language, which I had from going to a, a Gael School primary school. And I did loads of debating. And actually, I don't think, um, like, I think people think I'm really confident and really extroverted and outgoing. I'm not at all. I'm actually quite shy and introverted. Um, I just happened to work in the media and I think yeah. that the the debating I did like we won in all Ireland in fifth year um in debating through Irish me and myself and two of my pals and I that's where I got my kind of I call it confidence but it's almost like fake confidence it's like acting right. yeah. I just I learned the ability to get up and no matter how nervous you are just act Mm -hmm. confident so yeah. that really helped me but I didn't really realize until maybe 10 or 15 years later I looked back and I was like god if I hadn't done the debating I don't know if I would have been able to be a presenter because mm -hmm. it's very very similar yeah. um so so yeah in school like I was I was pretty good in school as well like I didn't mm -hmm. mind studying I studied as hard as I needed to I didn't I didn't overdo it either I didn't have time to overdo it because I had so many hobbies and mm -hmm. I think because I had my hobbies I was happy you know, yeah. I, yeah. It, ke it kept me like I had a lovely distraction from the books yeah. and I needed that. I really needed that. Like there were days and I, I couldn't wait. I, I needed to go to basketball training. 
I yeah. need to get away from the books. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for mm -hmm. uh, teenagers. I don't agree with this idea that you give up everything when you're doing your leaving cert. I, I just think mm -hmm. you need something outside of the classroom. And I and I had that and I, I got a great leaving cert. Um, mm -hmm. I was really happy with it. Um, and again, I was clever about the subjects I chose. Um, I chose music because I was playing music since I was five. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my mom's a music teacher. So I got my A in music. I got my A in Irish. And I used my own strengths to, to when I was picking those, like obviously mm -hmm. picking music. Yeah. Um, I wasn't great at maths. So, you know, I, mm -hmm. I was, I, I dropped down to pass because I was like, there's no point in me spending six hours on maths homework when I'm just not going to need it or use it or I'm not good at it. Mm -hmm. um so I was yeah I was fairly I was fairly clued in yeah good yeah well that you've made some really important points there Ivan I think for students that might be you know looking back at this about that idea of kind of you know being careful first of all to to keep everything going particularly the stuff that's good for you so I suppose mental well-being you know across everything is so important but particularly for students that are in school and dealing with exams and everything but very interesting as well that you made smart moves like dropping down to the past maths and being able to pace yourself better through leaving search as a result so that's really really important yeah I would have had friends who were doing music outside of school maybe but didn't pick music for the leaving cert mm -hmm. so they were heading off for double biology and they were trudging down the hall now some people love double biology yeah and I was heading off to play the clarinet play some jazz music which mm -hmm. was 50% of my exam results yeah. and I, that's what I was heading off to do for two hours and <laughs> the difference in my mood on those days and their mood um and I think a lot of people you know, maybe sometimes regret not thinking a bit more about what am I good, good at outside of school that I could yeah. actually, you know, would help me study less, for example. I didn't have mm -hmm. to spend as many hours studying mm -hmm. because I dropped the maths down and I did my music. So brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And the debate, I'm really interested in the debating because I'm actually also an Irish teacher. So I suppose we work very hard at trying to promote the Irish and yeah. the spoken Irish. And I actually remember doing that debate in myself, Mavin School, which was brilliant for confidence. Incredible then that that was something that kind of I suppose it resonated with you when you went on because you you chose to do communications in DCU so did you like think going into it that you were going to head into sports broadcasting or was that not on the cards no not at all um I I think you've probably picked up that I was a bit of an all-rounder I had loads mm -hmm. of interests I was interested in sport but I was always really I was also very interested in music and dance Mm -hmm. um and lots of other things too like mm -hmm. um but I think I was always going to gravitate towards some the arts in some direction yeah I and you also, did Ivan there was something I think about you thinking about heading for Broadway at some stage as well did that come up yeah well like there's a couple of really famous dance schools in London and I was dancing for years and you know by the time I got to my leaving cert um you know I was dancing a couple of times a week and I loved it and I, mm -hmm. I spoke briefly to my my teacher who had gone to one of these schools in London um, my dance teacher and she was kind of explaining what life was like you know yeah you'd go and you do your four years training whatever but then you end up in a cruise ship um before you actually like you don't just go and dance on Broadway like it's a mm. really really hard slog um and then she was like you're really tall so you can't eat <laughs> that was okay. the end of it so I was like no, okay. no way I'm doing that okay. um but to go back to your question about communication studies I I was such an I, was, I had such an all-round interest in so many different things I was actually really confused I was like what do I pick like I was never going to do anything to do with science or maths mm -hmm. or numbers because I just don't have that side of my brain is just not working. So it was always going to be um, I was interested in law. I was interested in um, things like, I don't know, I thought I was interested in things like PR and marketing, but I didn't really know what they meant. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I could write and I knew that I could speak and articulate myself and I could communicate well. Um, and my I was also raised by two teachers. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a very a strong influence as well in my life and I remember thinking I'm good at music I'm good at sport I could be a really good primary school teacher and do lots of extracurricular stuff with the kids but then I did a month filling in for somebody and I I, I don't have the patience for being a primary wow. school teacher I think they're <laughs> absolute saints um and then secondary school teaching I didn't really know if I wanted to teach the same subject for 40 mm -hmm. years or 30 years or whatever so I was really really confused and I didn't know what to put down and then somebody my mom actually heard about this course in DCU because somebody else that she knew their daughter had just started it mm -hmm. and the more I read up on it it was so broad right mm -hmm. now for some people that's a really bad thing because mm -hmm. you've no direction there's absolutely mm -hmm. you need to apply yourself in a course like that it's like mm -hmm. transition year it's what you make it mm -hmm. so for me I loved that it was so broad because yes we did things like radio television 
photography in later years not like you didn't do a huge amount of that in first year um but we also did things like journalism um we did a lot of creative writing mm -hmm. um we did things like cross-cultural communication semiotics psychology it was so 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 broad mm -hmm. but actually that's what appealed to me because I didn't know what I wanted to do and also you could do French and that was another thing I was very good at languages okay and um the French thing appeals to me because I thought oh well at least I can continue on with my French and see you know mm -hmm. does that bring me somewhere so I think I just kept a really open mind and because mm -hmm. I did that communication studies in DCU ended up being a perfect fit because it was still really open I didn't have to make any big decisions I could just delay that for another three years and have yeah. fun and enjoy the course yeah um, and it was only three years like a lot of the courses in DCU even at the time were four years yeah so I kind of knew going into it that I do something afterwards mm -hmm. um and I think with that particular course whether you do it straight away or you do it in a few years time it is a course that you kind of need to streamline your interest afterwards because okay. like a lot of that people that I was in college with would have gone on and done maybe a marketing master's or they would mm -hmm. have done a PR master's and um, I went on and did more I just focused more on journalism mm -hmm. afterwards um, and okay. I went to Galway for that and I did that through Irish because again I was like okay keep my options open maybe mm -hmm. I'll work through Irish so brilliant and where did things go from the from there with the journalism so I like I know you've ended up in RT but did you get straight into RTE or I think you did work with TG Catter at some stage, did you? Yeah. 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 So because I went to Galway then, um, I I kind of started thinking I want to work in TG Catter because I've got really mm -hmm. good Irish and um, I'm going to keep up the Irish. Obviously, I did the master. I did the postgrad through Irish. So mm -hmm. media law and journalism and all of those subjects, I got to do them through Irish when I had done a little bit of them through English in the undergrad. I yeah. got to do them through Irish and then I got to focus more on television and stuff as well as that. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> um, what happened at the end of that year was there was a month's placement with like a work experience placement thing. And there were only 15 in the class. And I remember asking if there was any opportunities in sport or, you know, you know, if there was anything that came up and there was. So I was lucky that nobody else really wanted that particular placement. Um, okay. And it was a placement with a show called Underdogs on TG Carr. Oh, so brilliant. It was, was only, yeah, it was only the second, I think it was the second year of it. So it was new enough. This was, this would have been 2004, the summer of 2004, I was kind of doing my placement. Mm -hmm. And um, so I moved to Dublin for that because the company was actually based in Dunleary. It was Adair Productions at the time. And I moved to Dublin and at the same time as kind of moving to Dublin, um, or maybe before I moved to Dublin, I started writing letters and kind of trying to make contact with producers in RTE because like the Athens Olympics was something that was on my mind. I knew that was coming up and I thought they're going to need somebody to make tea or they'll need somebody to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, whatever shot list. And that's what I ended up going and doing. But I, there was no ad for a job, you know, okay. and that's okay. kind of the way, that's kind of the way it works. And I also had no kind of family connection to the industry okay. which you know is still to this day is still a it's still a it does open doors you know okay even if okay. you even if it's to open a door to go in and make the tea it still opens yes. the door do you know what I mean yeah so I did that's something I didn't have but I did have friends like who had kind of started doing things in the industry while mm -hmm. they were in college like you know this thing it's called being a runner and that's where mm -hmm. you make the tea and stuff mm -hmm. and um but anyway, so I started writing letters and because of those people I knew working, I knew who to write the letters to. OK, so that's gotcha. how. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I ended up meeting for kind of a, I mean, in inverted commas, an interview, but it was a chat in okay. Kylie's and Donnybrook <laughs> okay. um, about the, the Athens Olympics. And they were really looking for just loads of bodies to help out okay. on the ground. And I went in with a lot of other young people that went in. Um, but I just re learned really quickly and okay. within a few weeks I was working every weekend on the Sunday game mm -hmm. and I just worked so hard because I wanted it so badly. Mm -hmm. um, and is that part of the thing, Ev or Ivan, is that, you know, like you have to almost serve your apprenticeship, serve your time, do the running, be there when needed, work all the hours. Is that just part of making it in the media? I think so. And I think it should be. Um, I think it's very, very beneficial. Um, it gives me a lot of perspective now that I'm like on air. I know mm -hmm. the work involved off air. I know how much work goes into, you know, preparing programs. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what you need to do. I've done all of the jobs on the way up. Mm -hmm. So I kind of I kind of know and I have respect for everybody that I work with. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's very hard for me to tell what it's like now because I'm not there now. 
-hmm. but I, I think it's the same yeah you do kind of need to be available um mm -hmm. don't I never said no I worked mm -hmm. seven days a week definitely in 2005 I think um because Adair brought me back to do another series of underdogs um and I was also getting freelance work with RTE because at the time RTE had they had all the live GA they had live mm -hmm. Heineken Cup they had live Premier League they had live horse racing I think they even had Formula One at that point as well mm -hmm. there was a lot of work there Okay, and, so with, yeah. with Yvonne, that's I suppose for, for young people, I'm very conscious of young people that would be looking at presenters, whether that's sport or otherwise in the media. And I suppose what you see is very much, you know, the front of house, you know, the, the glamorous side of it, if you like, or certainly, you know, the, the, the front face. But the stuff that's going around in the background or the work that has to be done to get to that stage is phenomenal. And I'm not sure young people always realize how, how hard that work is. Yeah, I think that's because social media has changed everything. Mm -hmm. um, there was no social media. There was no, like, I think I got an email address when I, when I went to college. There, like, technology has moved everything on so far that you can now almost create a platform on your own. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Now, it still takes a lot of hard work, but it's a completely different market now. It's a completely different industry. There are so mm -hmm. many, it's easier now to get in, I think, mm -hmm. because... Okay. You can almost market yourself online and like if i was talking to young people now who wanted to get into my line of work i would mm -hmm. be saying start writing start okay. writing start podcasting mm -hmm. start doing a youtube start whatever you're interested in and whatever you want to end up working in start now because you can post you can do a blog mm -hmm. and you can put it up online you can record a podcast and put it up online and then when you're you know trying to pitch yourself you're like oh well you know i'll just send you my links to all of my stuff that i've done yeah we didn't have you know that that just didn't exist and it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to explain that to younger people now because it's just such a huge part of their lives yeah. they all have a brand um mm -hmm. you know everybody has an instagram and everybody has um the ability to be on twitter and have an have an opinion and have people listen to that opinion mm -hmm. that just we didn't have that shop window okay. so i think now the shop window is so much bigger and there are mm -hmm. so many more opportunities to really get across your ability, your skills um, and mm -hmm. your talent. And mm -hmm. that's another reason why it's, you know, you get found out quite quickly too. Yeah. You know, and so you mentioned there now about the brand, Ivan, you know, and that branding is so important across, you know, all careers, I suppose now. But also you describe yourself as maybe not being the extrovert that people would think. So do you find it difficult, you know, that publicity side that, you know, that that's a part of being recognized, we'll say, in the public eye and that? Is that something that you find difficult or do you take it in your stride now? I think I take it in my stride now because I understand that I have a voice and okay. that um, and I also understand that I have to be careful with my voice mm -hmm. because, you know, some people actually do listen to me. <laughs> yeah <laughs> my children don't but some yeah. people do um I think I found it very very strange in the beginning because I remember being I remember being caught out a couple of times early in my career when I started to be um work on air so I was in RT for at least two years before I ever held a microphone but okay. when I did start to do that I remember thinking like I remember being asked something by a journalist and it ended up in the papers and I was going okay hold on like I didn't know that was what, what that was for mm -hmm. and I just remember thinking, I remember just being cringing and I still cringe sometimes because I, I, sometimes, I, I, I could, I do get taken, you can be misquoted yeah, or something you say can be taken out of context. Context, yeah. And I still cringe sometimes when I see headlines because it's not mm -hmm. what I meant when I said what I said, or it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not related to the point I was trying to make, whatever. So, um, but there's nothing you can really do about that. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing you can do really is control what you can control which is your mm -hmm. own accounts and your own mm -hmm. um, with what you do decide to say about something mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily struggle with it but I don't enjoy it like I don't okay. enjoy the fact that you know and maybe I'm supposed to have an opinion on everything and I'm supposed mm -hmm. to everyone's supposed to know my opinion on everything because yes. you know that's not really what I would emphasize what I would put an emphasis on yeah when I if I was to describe my place in society like so, I'm just yeah. doing a job I'm a journalist I go to work I work hard I have a very strong life outside of my job yeah. as well and I value that just as much as I do my career so mm -hmm. um yeah I suppose no I don't really struggle with it but it is mm -hmm. a little bit weird it is a little mm -hmm. bit weird that people care what you say but you know you just have to take that and take responsibility for it and be careful yeah yeah and listen just your, your master's then I'm fascinated by the master's that you did which was really a different area the whole area of governance which is 
fascinating um you know so where, where did that interest come from I I see I love I actually love learning I'm a bit of a nerd I, I like I said I always enjoyed school um and in 2013-14 I was in RTE 10 years in 2014 we'll say right mm-hmm. and I remember thinking okay am I going to be here for another 30 years or what's you know yeah I didn't want to just kind of rest on my laurels and get too comfortable and um I think it's important to keep challenging yourself and move outside of your comfort zone mm-hmm. so I applied to do a master's now obviously I was working full-time I had a two-year-old and I was pregnant so I was busy Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I decided to do it part-time over two years which really suited me because I was able to work and then I ended up being on maternity leave for a lot of it and now I had a newborn so like it wasn't exactly all plain sailing but my mom helped me out a lot with minding the kids and stuff so this was a master's in sports management in UCD Mm -hmm. now I looked into a good few courses before I chose this particular one I looked into there's a FIFA master um, Mm -hmm. as well which I looked into, but that's, you know, that, that at the time, nothing was online, everything was abroad. Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine had done it, and she's a sports lawyer now. I interviewed her for the first series. That's right, podcast. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I looked into that, and then I looked into a couple of things with the Open University. Mm-hmm. And then I found this one in UCD, and it sounded perfect, because it wasn't just, uh, governance was one element of it, but there was also sports marketing, sports law. Mm-hmm. Um, there was event management. It was a whole whole pile of stuff. And again, you could pick and choose. There were a lot mm-hmm. of rugby modules, a lot of golf modules, if you were working in that sector, which mm-hmm. I wasn't. I was interested in under, making sure I understand any story that could break, whether okay. it's sports, whether it's doping, whether mm-hmm. it's governance related, whether it is um, something to do with financial fair play. I wanted to understand the nitty gritty of the industry I worked in. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where it was coming from. Now, as it turned out, I did love governance and law, Mm -hmm. and I ended up doing my my thesis Mm -hmm. on governance, which was um, it was a look at how uh, how a federation could um, basically restore trust after a breach of integrity or whatever. Now, ironically, I handed it in and a week later, Patrick, he got arrested. Okay, so it was exactly. Yeah, it was exactly that. That was the reason why I did it. I wanted to understand if something like that was to happen. I wanted Mm -hmm. to fully understand um, the background, the consequences and all of Mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, I just, I mean, I still, I still do the job I do, but I I also have that interest and I have that qualification. I Mm -hmm. I have, you know, made a lot of contacts in that sector as well. So, Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably, it's probably given you extra insights just when you are dealing with those stories event, which is hugely helpful. You know, you know, you're not going to say the wrong thing or, you know, that you have a better insight into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well. And I, and I trust myself and I trust my knowledge and then people can trust what I say because I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I have found it like, I mean, I haven't in inverted commas used it yet because I haven't got a new job or I haven't taken a different career path. But I, I also wouldn't rule it out, you know. Yeah. I, I like learning. I like challenging myself. Yeah. Brilliant. So speaking of which, challenging yourself, you're after a really busy couple of weeks um, with the, the Paralympics, not to mind your coverage then of RT Sports and the G and everything. So tell me, just I suppose that the Paralympics, you it was something certainly came across that you were very, very passionate about yourself and thrilled to be involved in. But you weren't there this time round. So it was a different experience to Rio where you were at the event. So I'd love to just find out how it felt for you this time round, presenting in a different way and how that compared with actually being there um, at the live events. There are two very different roles. Like Mm -hmm. they're so, so different. Um, Being there is the biggest rush um you know because you're heading away on a trip and you are you don't know what you're doing every day from one day to the next um Mm -hmm. because you know your line manager whoever it is is going to say right today you're at the pool tomorrow you're at the diving center okay next day you're at gymnastics or you're whatever same with the olympics Um, Mm and you just kind of see to your pants and i thrive on pressure i thrive on deadlines i love you know i I don't know i think it's suited to some people Mm -hmm. and it's not suited to other people and it's quite a stressful trip first you know mm-hmm. something like the olympics paralympics you work every day you're you know you're often pulling like 14 16 hour days because mm-hmm. you could be going to a couple of different events on the same day and i mean rio and tokyo some of them were quite spread out i know paris yeah. everything is going to be within you know a 10 kilometer radius it'll be very very different but and um, it does depend on where you are and london was quite similar it was very very close together mm-hmm. but um yeah so it is um it can be if you're that way inclined it would be very, it would be very stressful 
Okay. You know, because you're working off um, a lot of spur of the moment things like, okay, mm-hmm. you're to go here. And then somebody, somebody is there competing for Ireland and they crash or they fail a drugs test or mm-hmm. like you need to be able to respond to whatever happens. And then okay. you need to be able to tell that story in a very concise manner. Mm-hmm. And for to get it back to Dublin on time with a time difference. And like it, like there's lots of things, but I, I just love that. I love that pressure yeah. and I thrive on it. Um, being in Dublin was completely different, obviously, because I was in studio, but you got a much more, you got a much better helicopter view of what was going on because you mm-hmm. weren't at one venue every day. Okay. You know, you were covering every single story and mm-hmm. you were also covering, we were covering more than just the Irish story because we were looking at wheelchair basketball. We were looking at goalball. We were looking at lots of different things and just trying to give a sense of the games themselves. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I loved both roles, to be honest. I mean, mm-hmm. I didn't go to Tokyo because, you know, I'm expecting and I didn't, mm-hmm. you know, it wouldn't have been safe. But um, I was always going to sit in the Paralympic studio chair here in Dublin. Like I was going to go to the Olympics and then come back for the Paralympics. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I loved it. Um, and I think every time the Paralympic Games roll around, we're seeing more and more coverage. We're mm-hmm. seeing stronger representation um, and we're seeing less box ticking and more actual interest mm-hmm. in what's going on so I mm-hmm. loved being a part of that yeah fantastic and I know that um the whole issue of I suppose women's participation in sport but also the coverage of women's sport is something that you're you know very very I suppose is important to you um but it's changed a lot Ivan, hasn't it I mean since you must have seen huge changes since you started for the better um but I wonder have we ways to go yet what do you think uh, oh, we definitely have a ways to go yet. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I everything it, like it is a completely different landscape than it was in two thousand and four. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we just hadn't, as a, as a, as a society, as a nation, we hadn't woken up to, we hadn't woken up to any of the stories about women. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that probably is not just related to sport. I think that was just. Um, a long two decade awakening over the last while um, of the importance of telling the stories of women across mm-hmm. sport and the arts and you know entertainment um medicine stem mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. so yes obviously it has changed completely um i don't i'm trying to remember did we have any specifically women's sports broadcast I, I don't think we did when mm-hmm. I joined RTE in 2004 so um unless it was Olympics or you know things like tennis and horse racing which is kind of you know they're always shown as a block but mm-hmm. um I so yes everything has changed and it has changed obviously it has changed for the better um not only for telling stories about women but for even women telling stories mm-hmm. so um I think people listen to women more mm-hmm. um, I think they respect the opinions of women more mm-hmm. um, but I do think it's been a bit of a slog yeah. to get to this point and we're mm-hmm. still not finished mm-hmm. if the, I don't know if that answers yeah. your question yeah but- no it does but I suppose do you do you think especially because of your your interest in sports management and all that do you think that that a lot more needs to be done you know at higher levels to to, to push that on it, do, it does but women need to put their hands up as well you know mm-hmm. um like I went back and did that master's and it was really awkward in my life in my mm-hmm. personal life to go back and do that master's and I think more women need to take those jumps mm-hmm. um and get some help um mm-hmm. whether it's with their careers or with their family lives but also like put your hand up to be on a committee in your local club yeah um because that's where it starts and mm-hmm. then you know put your hand up to be on the board of management of mm-hmm. your swimming team or your whatever mm-hmm. and then that's how like obviously everything at, at grassroots level is volunteer led and, and like mm-hmm. you know i'm involved in my club i'm coaching mm-hmm. um and again that was something the 20 by 20 movement they asked us to make a pledge you know mm-hmm. and i was like well what can i do that i'm not already doing i'm already talking about women i'm already going to these events now obviously i'm it's part of my job so what can i do that's not part of my job that i can actually pledge something that would make a difference to my life and the one thing was um there's a huge lack of female coaches mm-hmm. and if you think about girls who are between the ages of say eight and 15 and the, the dropout rates are still really high mm-hmm. but i mean they're not seeing they're not always seeing a female that they can relate to in a coaching position mm-hmm. who's going to inspire them to stay on 
And that's part of the problem, actually, is coaching. Okay. Um, okay. we need to have more female coaches and that's why I decided right well I'll just jump in and try and be a coach um, yeah. so that's I think that's one of the next steps that we need yeah. to take I do think we need to stop calling it women's sport as in not not I think we need to stop calling it making it something special women in sport I mean yeah. we need we needed to do that 10 years ago we had mm-hmm. to make it a catchphrase you know mm-hmm. but I think the next step is to forget about the catchphrase and just talk about sport and if you're talking yeah. about Kelly Harrington fine or if you're talking about Kurt Walker fine yeah and um, they're both boxers so yeah. like just talk about them as boxers don't talk mm-hmm. about them as male and female and um, I would hate to be described as a female sports broadcaster I mean it would absolutely drive me nuts Right. So I think the next step is to just drop all that kind of tokenism, women's sport yeah. phraseology and just okay. start talking about sport. But we also need to just support each other. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's a match tomorrow night at the Ta- Tala Stadium, Ireland or Lake Australia. Um, I'm going to go. I'm going to bring the kids. I'm interested to see what the crowds are like. Yeah. Um, I got tickets for the kids and myself for 20 quid. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we do have a bit more, we do have a bit more work to do. Mm-hmm. And, and that goes for, you know, that game will be on television, but the Rugby World Cup qualifiers were not on television. They were streamed on the, the RTE player. Mm-hmm. But again, that was a Rugby World Cup qualifier yesterday with everything on the line. If that was a man's mm-hmm. World Cup qualifier, it would have been on telly. Yeah. So look, we have that. They're the things we need to do. And like the World Cup is next year. So the Rugby World Cup, Women's World Cup needs to be on telly. Mm-hmm. The okay. last one was, the last one yeah. was, um, it was here in Dublin, actually, and the matches were on telly. And then the one previous to that, I went to it, actually, but the matches weren't on RTE, I don't think. I don't mm-hmm. think they were on free to wear. I can't remember. Okay. So, I mean, it's kind of, it's just taken a bit of time to get to where we need yeah. to go. And we're still not finished, but we're definitely on the right trajectory. Yeah, brilliant. I know we're kind of conscious of time event, but I really, I'd love to know, what would be your favourite sporting event to, to be involved in? It can be one that you've been involved in already or one that you haven't. We're not conscious of time at all. Don't worry. Oh. <laughs> we can keep talking. Okay. Keep talking. Um, I suppose one that I haven't been involved in already. I mean, I would love, I don't know. Um, I've been involved in a lot of different sports and I've had different roles in those sports. Um, I love anchoring the Camogie coverage um, I, because I played, I love the game. And um, that's one of the kind of, you know, pinnacles for me is to kind of, you know, like the All-Ireland Finals last weekend yeah. or the All-Ireland Finals last Christmas, which are completely different because the place is empty and it's yeah. like a Saturday night. Mm. Um, I, I love, I, I just love standing there talking to other people mm-hmm. um, and delivering that coverage and um, talking to other people about the games or whatever. Um, I, I have an interest in NFL and it yeah. hasn't been on, it hasn't been on RTE in decades yeah um and if that was to come back I'd love to work on that um I don't really have huge ambition to work on certain things but I'd love to go to Wimbledon I've never been I'd love to yeah like I mean again I'd never been to NFL games until the last few years I went to a few in the last few years um but I'd love to go to things like Wimbledon and I'd love to experience a Formula One race for example okay um things like that working I mean, experiencing, I think, is the better word. Experiencing other sports is the word to... I don't define my success by the jobs that I do because, you know, if I get given a job to do, it's just one person's decision. And if I'm not their cup of tea and that person decides to to ask someone else to do it, I don't really really take a hit in confidence there because I know I'm good at what I do. Um, And this business is all about maybe one or two people deciding who gets to do things. Mm -hmm. And those one or two people change all the time. And their mm-hmm. opinions are, they have their opinions and other people have other opinions. So yeah. whatever I do and don't do, I just get on with it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and if I'm asked to do something great, if I'm, uh, if I'm overlooked for something, I don't, it doesn't bother me um, okay. in terms of my confidence. It doesn't bother yeah. me in terms of my ambition mm-hmm. um, because I happen to just love doing all of the things that I do. And I'm, I'm mm-hmm. pretty lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have a good life balance as well good. Um, because I work every second weekend okay um, which like lots of people would hate to work any weekends at all but mm-hmm. that's just you can't expect to work in sport and not work weekends that's just crazy mm-hmm. and Ivan if you weren't doing what um, you're doing now have you another dream job that you would love to do it's funny since I started the podcast every time I interview someone I'm like oh that's 
really interesting. I'd love to do the job. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm I can serious. Actually, I can understand that actually as you were going through the podcast, I was saying, God, yeah, that's my favorite so far. Yeah. And then it came to the next one. I thought, oh my God, no, I love that one now. You were so good. You listened to them all and you gave <laughs> feedback. You were like, that's why you're here. I um, cl- I was the closet fan, Yvonne. I was probably <laughs> one of those lunatic fans. <laughs> no, I think... Um, going back to when I was in school and what I what I loved and what I loved in college as well and even what I loved when I went back to the master's I think I'd love to be a lawyer and work in sports law yeah um and my friend Anya Power is a sports lawyer Mm. uh she lives in Lausanne um she's a wonderful life out there and she's she's like she's really good at what she does Mm -hmm. and she's worked in a few different federations and you know she has a really bright future as well um but her I just love um I don't know. I, I think I think if I was to be doing anything else, I would like to think I would be gone down the road of law. OK, because I would have loved it. Um, mm-hmm. like I used to love watching all the lawyer programs on telly and imagining myself like doing my debating, but actually being in a courtroom. Yeah. Yeah. And delivering delivering um, uh, a monologue about something. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think, yeah, probably sports law is something that um, if yeah. I wasn't doing this, maybe I'd wish to be doing. And listen, are you delighted with how, you know, the podcast has been a massive success? It's great. There's another series, you know, coming on down the line. And I suppose from a guidance point, point of view, Ivan, like it's a huge thing for us as guidance counselors. So many young people are interested in sport now and interested in making sport their job. And the question we will always get asked from them and their parents is, but like, what, what am I going to do? What job am I going to do at the end of this? You know, mm. so I think what, what this has done is really, really expanded people's viewpoint about what's out there. You know, it's so varied and people are not all coming from sporting um, based degrees or programs. They're coming from no. very, very different backgrounds. Um, and, and the insight into the careers has been has been brilliant. So you must be really delighted with how it's how it's gone down and how it's developed. Yeah, it was just a little it was just a little passion project. Like, mm. to be honest, I started it in April because I was going through IVF and I wanted to be distracted. That's okay. the truth. That's a great reason. <laughs> yeah. And I had this idea that I was kind of knocking around in my head. And where I got the idea was I get a lot of questions like you mm. probably about how do I get into sport or how did you get into sport? And like sometimes mm. I'm actually I don't know how to answer it because I'm like, do you mean which degree I'm using or do you mean, yeah. you know, was I into it when I was younger? Um, like it really irks me when people like taxi drivers in like, you know, random people ask me, uh, were you into sport? Is, or, like, have you always been into sport? Like, how could you not be if you're in this in this job? Like, I just yeah. don't understand. And like, I, 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 it, I have to bite my tongue because I always want to say, would you ask a man that question? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, are you into, do you like sport? Yeah. Like, would you ask, you just wouldn't ask them. Yeah. So um, I think because I got asked so many questions from like from young people, from people mm-hmm. on Instagram who just kind of messaged me out of the blue, like I'd love to do something in sport. How do I do it? There's no easy answer because there are so many options and mm. people don't realize how many options there are. And that's why I wanted to do it because it's not just jobs like mine that you might maybe see more of. And mm. um, there are so many other jobs and most of them are more interesting than mine. <laughs> um, and, you know, can probably be transferred you can work abroad or you can work, you know, and mm-hmm. lots of people that I've interviewed and I actually was speaking to them from London or Switzerland or wherever. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted with it. Mm-hmm. I haven't really, I wouldn't call it a huge success. I just, <laughs> I'm happy with it because yeah. it does exactly what it says in the tin. And mm-hmm. I do think there are people who are genuinely wondering how they get the ball rolling if they want to mm-hmm. work in sport. Mm -hmm. um so yeah I kind of hope it's shed a light on just Mm -hmm. how many options there are because you know even things like you know talking to Deborah from Mm. the The LSP yeah yes yeah and like there's an LSP in every county Mm. and you know there's five or six people on staff in every single one of them yeah and you know that's a real I think that was an eye opener for a lot of people because yeah. they didn't realize that maybe oh, I don't really want to move to Dublin or Cork or Limerick yeah. or, or, or London or New York. I want yeah. to work in Carlow or I want to work in Leitrim. Every yeah. county has an LSP. I don't yeah. think people realize that. Yeah. So um, from that point of view, I do think it's been good. Yeah. And actually even to show the different journeys, like they haven't been direct routes in. No. You know? And I suppose that's the way we're, you know, when we're talking to students in school, we're reminding them that their journey is 
you know, it's going to happen over a long period of time. There's going to be lots of highs and lows and lots of changes. And it is extremely difficult for them at 16 or 17 or 18 to try and decide, you know, like I hear them all, all, always saying, you know what, I can't decide what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I said, you don't have to. You just need to decide what you want to do for the next couple of years, you mm -hmm. know, and then it, it kind of evolves a little bit more from that. So I think that was great about listening to the stories, how the, the roots were, were quite different, where, you yeah. know, where people ended up were maybe different to how they thought they would Goal, that's one, you know? that, that is one thing I would say to young people, like particularly, I know you're you're obviously dealing with a lot of students in fifth and sixth year going, oh, yeah. what am I going to do? The one thing I would say is, I mean, I remember asking somebody um, recently, maybe six or seven years ago, oh, what are you going to do or whatever? It was like a distant family member. And she said, oh, law or medicine. Okay. And I was like, oh, they're so different. Like, mm. what, what's the common denominator? Points yeah don't yeah. think about what you can use your points for like don't mm -hmm. think oh I'm going to like I got 500 and something points. I didn't use them because mm -hmm. I, I didn't do a course that needed them don't think about your points yeah think about what you're going to enjoy doing every day when you go back to school basically same school college in September like yeah. and that's why I chose communications because I thought okay well I'm not going to hate it <laughs> yeah I, I'm probably going to be interested enough to get up and go every day because it was mm -hmm. so so varied um and it wasn't definitive like I didn't do yeah I didn't do something I didn't do accounting to become an accountant mm -hmm. um and lots of people do accounting to become something completely different so what I would say is do something just to do the course and enjoy the course and see which part of the course you enjoy mm -hmm. and then decide what you want to do with it yeah I wouldn't be one for saying what do I be out of that yeah I think that's really I think that's a really traditional view. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of parents would have done it years ago. Um, mm -hmm. You know, go do teaching because you'll be a teacher. Go do, go to the bank because you'll be a banker. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid. I remember some of my own friends, their parents were freaking out because they wanted to do arts. But you know, what yeah. do you do with arts? Like, how can a job do you get? You can, anything. You can do anything. Yeah. 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 Because within arts, you can do political science, you can do English, you can do geography, you can do whatever. So yeah. I just think it's really important to keep an open mind and not put yourself under pressure about what your job is going to be. Like, I yeah. have no idea at 16, 17, 18, 20, what my job is going to be. No idea yeah. at all. Yeah. And I think also, you know, young people do an awful lot of their growing up after they leave us in school you know ah, yeah they, they you know their and they're doing their learning and you learn a lot more about yourself when you get out into the workplace I think there's nothing to beat that you know yeah. the skills that you learn and all the rest of it so I think you've actually my final question I think you've answered it which is you know what advice would you give to your 17 year old self I suppose I'm I'm a guidance counselor but I'm also a mother of teenagers and you know I mean you've given great advice there in relation to career if you were talking back to the 17 year old Ivan now you know what would you say to her would you have any words of advice? I would. Um, and this is probably going to sound, I don't know what way it's going to sound, but this is my God's honest truth. Don't be afraid to shine. Okay. Don't be afraid of being good at something. Mm -hmm. um, if other people have an issue with you, maybe, I don't know, going <laughs> stay on the carpet <laughs> not even that but like yeah I remember playing down at different times in my life playing down my ability okay because I kind of got the feeling people were maybe not being very nice okay and that was all coming from envy now I didn't see it at the time yeah but I would have been bullied in school and various things and like a lot of people go through things like that mm -hmm. um and what it did to me was when I went to college I was afraid to really shine because I was okay. like oh I don't want to kind of I don't want to look I don't want to stand out okay um now I actually don't think young people have this problem but I just think it's a much more open and a more open society mm -hmm. now but I I would hate for people to be afraid to let themselves reach their potential just mm -hmm. because other people feel threatened by your abilities or mm -hmm. by your talents or whatever mm -hmm. so that's one thing I would say and then the other thing is like I said earlier just keep an open mind and enjoy mm -hmm. college or enjoy not going to college enjoy your life it, like enjoy your 20s yeah um, and learn who you are because that's when I learned who I was definitely I didn't yeah. have a clue who I was when I was in uh school not no notion. no no it takes time and it's all those experiences that happen as you do that growing up really that that you know kind of form you as a person but I love that idea not being afraid to shine I do think Yvonne there are still young people that would feel that um, not wanting to, to maybe they pull back a little bit or hold back so I think it is um, I think that's fantastic fantastic advice for everybody 
Um, so I think that covers a lot of the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, Ivan, I th feel like it should be almost like a job interview where I should say, is there anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> or have you covered it all? Um, but it's been, it's been great. It's been lovely to interview. It's moving outside of my comfort zone, so I'm delighted that I did it. Well, you're an and absolute pro. There's not you, a were, you were very easy to interview in fairness, so thanks a million for the opportunity and I'm really looking forward to the to the guests that you're going, you've lined up for us in, in um, Series 2. Thank you so much, Niamh. Um, and Yes, series two is going to be great. And series one was great too. And I'll just remind everybody, all of those older episodes will be up on Spotify as well if you want to look back and listen to the various careers. But um, we've got some brilliant guests lined up for series two as well. So thank you for kicking it off, Neve. I really appreciate great. it. Great. <laughs> Very excited. <laughs> thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Neve.